So for the definition of the pre-stressing, we are going to use the inbuilt filter and we are going to turn on the filter structure by type and group to only visualize the structural elements in the system. Then let's go to the pre-stressing tab, which can be found here, and then have an overview about the options of the pre-stressing. As you can see, there are three major types, namely the beam pre-stress, shell pre-stress, and the slab pre-stress. In this example 5, we are going to use the beam pre-stress chapter. However, when you have a 3D system full of structural areas, then you must use the shell pre-stress chapter. For historical reasons, when you have a 2D slab system, you still have the possibility to define a slab pre-stressing system. However, I do not recommend to do so with the help of these comments. I encourage you to do so also with the shell pre-stress commands below. Anyway, the command description and the command structure is very strange for the beam pre-stress and for the shell pre-stress system. So what I'm going to explain now for the beam pre-stress systems will be applicable for the shell elements as well. We distinguish between two geometry types, namely the spline geometry and the polygonal geometry. If we choose for the spline geometry, and then later on in the editor we are going to define the points of the duct along the structure, then the software tries to create a spline geometry along the given duct points. If we choose the polygon polygonal geometry and we also insert the geometry points for the duct geometry, the system or the software will try to create a polygonal geometry based upon the given points. So the main difference is basically that the software will create a spline based upon the given geometry point of the duct or it's going to get to a straight polygonal geometry based upon the inserted or defined geometric points of the duct. The use case of these two options are as follows. Normally we choose the spline geometry when we have internal ducts and tendons, which means the ducts and the tendons are running inside our cross-section. On the other hand, when we have an external pre-stressing, and the ducts and the tendons are running outside our cross-section, then we choose the second option, the poly polygonal geometry. When we choose either of the first two options, we are going to be working in a so-called duct editor or duct geometry editor. And we are going to set up the geometry of the duct and the tendons in this editor. But, it, but there is also a third option, when we draw an AutoCAD line or an AutoCAD polyline to select this AutoCAD polyline as the geometry of the duct for our tendons. I suggest you to work uh, the PT editor, the pre-stress editor, either if you have a spline geometry or a polygonal geometry, because you have much more options in this PT editor to create your duct and the tendons, and furthermore, later on, you have much more possibilities to change or re review anything on the already defined geometry. Contrary to the first two options, if you choose the draw tendon command based upon an AutoCAD polyline entity, you do not have too many options later on to edit or to review the already drawn geometry of the tendon. Therefore, in the next chapter, I'm going to show how the PT editor works with the spline geometry. This chapter, I'm going to start with the basic functionalities of the PT editor. So simply choose and click on the PT editor. Then the pre-stressing system dialog box will appear. The definition or the setup of a pre-stressing system is very important. Plenty relevant and useful information are stored within it to be able to create the geometry of the duct. For example, the minimum radius of the duct is stored here at the duct geometry and without it the software will not know 
what is the minimum radius that the duct can be bent over. First, we need to enter a number for the pre-stressing system. By default, it is set to 1. Maybe if you have many pre-stressing systems in one model file, then it is useful to assign different names to the individual systems. For example, in this particular example file, I try to re recreate one of the VSL tendons, and therefore I'm going to just add the name of VSL612. Then the first and foremost information to uh, enter or to input is the pre-stressing steel material. Previously we set up uh, material number 4 as a pre-stressing steel material according to EN 1992. So now we are just going to use this material for the pre-stressing system definition. In the next input field, you need to add the number of the strands. In my example file, I'm going to use 12 strands, and the area of one strand needs to be added as well. Here, I'm going to override the 150 to 143 millimeters square, and the area as per tendon is presented right away on the right side. In the next chapter, the calculation of the maximum permissible force, the p nul max, is going to be calculated and presented as follows. So the software will use the so-called FT value, which is the limiting tensile force of the material. In this case, it is 1570, as in the indication of the material. And the other value that is used is the so-called FY value, which is the tensile strength of the steel material. In this case, it is 1300 megapascal. And according to Eurocode, the FT will, de will be multiplied with K1, which is 0 0.8, and the FY value will be multiplied with K2, which is 0 0.9. The minimum of these two multiplication will be taken over and will be used as the permissible force P null max. The permissible force, the P null max, will be multiplied with the AZ that was calculated here and being equal now with 1716 mm square. And from this multiplication, we are going to get finally the nominal force per tendon, P null value, which is in this case equals with 2007. 0.7 kilonewton. I would like to give you two additional information. If you change, for example, the number of strands, then this field is not going to be automatically calculated. You need to click in this field, and then on the right side you have this recalculate or reset to default button, and then it's going to be recalculated. So again, if I set it back to 12, for example, then I need to click here and then reset and then the value will be recalculated. The other information I would like to give you is about the factors K1 and K2. It is a common question from the customers whether or not the K1 and the K2 value can be changed later on because according to their national annex these factors are different. The answer is yes, it is possible to change the value of factors K1 and K2. And I will show you how to do that later on when we are defining the duct geometry and the tendons within it. Now we can move on to the immediate losses tab. So basically there are two types of losses. The first one is the immediate loss and the second one is the long-term loss. The long-term losses will be considered and calculated only in the construction stage manager when we are running the module CSM. So there is no influence here in the pre-stressing system dialog box or at the setup of the pre-stressing to influence the long-term losses. However, we can influence the immediate losses. The immediate loss is based upon two things or two values, namely the slip at the active anchor and the friction coefficient. Both of them can be defined here in the immediate losses tab. 
For the slip at the active anchor, I'm going to use the 6 mm because it's a standard value for the slip. For the warble coefficient, I'm going to enter 0 0.300. And then we can go and have a look at the tag geometry tab. Below the tag geometry tab, we can set the geometric properties of the duct, such as the outer diameter of the duct, which could be very important if the duct is going very close to the fiber of the cross section. You can also set the maximum eccentricity in the duct, because normally the duct is not always in the center of the duct geometry, but it has some eccentricity and gives you extra bending moments, for example, onto the cross section. Another important geometric property is the minimum radius of the curvature in the duct. Basically, this value determines how much you can bend the duct. And another important property is the minimum distance between the axis of the duct to the boundary of the cross section. Now I'm just going to overwrite some of the value here to match with the VSL standard. So the outer diameter of the duct is going to be 90 millimeter. The maximum eccentricity in the duct will be 14 millimeter. The minimum radius of the curvature will be 4.3 meter. And the minimum distance between the axis and the boundary will be set to 70 millimeter. So all the geometric properties and the values regarding the immediate losses can be found in the brochures of the manufacturers and you can simply fill out these values if you download the brochures from the manufacturers. As now we entered all the necessary information regarding the pre-stressing system, we simply click on OK and now we are getting back to the definition of the duct geometry and now as the sophistic says we need to select an axis. So I will simply select the main axis of our system and now we are directed to the pre-stressing editor. In this dialog box you will find two major setting options or two main windows, namely the edit geometry and the edit tendons. On the edit geometry tab we are editing the geometry of the duct and then on the edit tendons we set the properties of the tendons within the duct. Okay, let's start with the explanation of the edit geometry window. On the right side you will see a scale elevation slider. You can work with it and if you move it to the right side the elevation will be increased and maybe this value can be better used to visualize the settings. This window now is presented in the elevation view because as you can see it is selected with yellow color. But you can also view your structure, I mean your duct and its geometry from the plan view when you click on the plan view button and then you click on the zoom extents it will be zoomed in and the whole duct geometry will be presented now from the plan view. If the duct has any deviation in the horizontal direction then you will be able to see this in the plan view. For the editing of the duct normally we work in the elevation view. One additional information to control the view is that you can use your middle mouse button and scroll it and then you will be able to zoom in and out to a certain point. For example, if I want this geometry point to be in the middle, I just hover over my mouse and I will start to zoom with my middle mouse button by scrolling it. Then you will see this geometry point will be closer to the middle point of the screen. At least I will be able to see the changing around this geometry point much better. If you now click on the zoom extends button, then the structure will appear with its extent again and you can zoom into the desired position. Also you can drag the view with your middle mouse button 
when you push it and drag it. Now I will talk to you about the geometry points. To have a better overview of what I'm doing, I will make this window a little bit wider by dragging it and moving it to be able to see all the fields here. So in the geometry points chapter, you can see five entry lines. If you select any of these entry lines, then the corresponding geometry point will be selected on the screen. In the geometry points table, a multi-selection is also possible. For example, now I'm selecting the geometry points at the middle support and at the end of the structure. This functionality enables me to enter certain properties, not just for one geometry point, but for multiple points. At this area, we can control the properties of these geometric points. One of the most important property is the location of these geometry points. And we can control their location based upon station values given in meters or spatial values, which are unitless values. To understand what the span station means, let me first remind you of the placement definition in our model. If you remember, we set up placements along the axis to tell the software where is the beginning of our structure, where is the first support line placement, where is the second support line placement, where is the third support line placement, and where is the end of our structure. When we define the placements, we could assign such properties to the placements, for example, support or access at the beginning or access at the end. And now you will understand why it was very important to define the placement with these assignments. One of the reasons is that now at the tendon definition, the software will automatically recognize these station assignments or placements assignments and the software will be able to create an automatically generated geometry for the duct such as presented on the screen. Now I will try to explain the meaning of the span stations. In the span station column you can see a number with a dot and two digits after it. The number on the left of the dot tells you which station are you at. For example, if I click on the first line, I am at the beginning of the first span. If I click on the third line, I am at the beginning of the second span. If I click on the last line, I am at the beginning of the third span. And the numbers on to the right of the dot can be understood as the multiplicator of the span length. For example, if I select the second line, I am in the first span. I can see it from the value on the left side of the dot. And I am over the beginning of the first span with the multiplication of the span length with 0 0.40. So beginning of the first span plus 0 0.4 times the length of the first span. Then I will reach the second span. Then for this geometry point, I am after the second span plus a multiplication of the span lengths with 0 0.60. And this is the location of this point. Finally, I will reach the third span with the multiplication of 0 of the next span length. The corresponding station values in meter can be seen to the left, but they are grayed out because now we are working in span stations. If I change any of the span station values, for example this 1.4 to 1.6, and click on the next line, you will see that the geometry of the geometry point has been changed automatically. And together with it, 
the station value in meter. Now I will set this back to 1.4. Of course, if you don't like the enter or the input of the geometry points in span station, then you have the possibility to change for the station values in meter. What you need to do is just to select all the entry lines and then go to the right side and at the geometry, instead of the span station, you need to select the stations. And as you can see, now if we go back to the geometry points, it is possible to change any of the stations in meter now. For example, I will change the second entry line to 21 meter and click. If I add, for example, 25 and then click, the change will be more significant and you will see the change much better. Also, you will see the corresponding change in the span station value. Personally, I like to work better with the span station values, so I will set everything back to span stations and I will also set back the position of the second geometry point to 1.4 span station value. Now I will continue with the explanation of the U and the V value. So generally speaking, the V value controls the position of the geometry points in vertical direction, whereas the U value controls the position or location of the geometry points in the horizontal direction. Let me demonstrate it. For example, if I select the second entry line and the fourth uh, entry line with my control button, then on the right side I can change the V value to be equal with 1.15 and then click somewhere else. And then you can see that the vertical position of the geometry point has been changed. Similarly, if I go to the U values and instead of the zero meter, I will set to 1.5 meter the value of the U and then click somewhere. Now it seems nothing happened but if we go to the plan view we can see by increasing the scale of the plan view you can see that the second and the first geometry points location has been changed in the horizontal direction because now we are looking at the structure from the plan view. As now we know the meaning of the U and the V values, I would like to show you how to insert a new geometry point to the system. Basically, you need to select one line and click with your right mouse button. And as you can see, you can insert a row before or after the selected line. For example, I will choose to insert a row after the selected one. And at span station 1.7, a new point has been inserted delete such a, a new entry you just need to select the new line right click on it and choose the delete row option so if you accept the number of the geometry points in the system or in the duct then you will see that the software tries to create a spline over these points and you have the possibility to control the spline geometry if you enter some reasonable value in the table. Let me demonstrate it to you, but first I will set back every settings to the default. So I will select the entry line number 2 and 4, and I will simply set back the U value to uh, 0. And now I will go back to the elevation view and zoom in a little bit. And now I will be able to show you what is the effect, for example, to insert a strain length before a geometry point or after a geometry point? I will select the second entry line once more and enter a value here with 2 meter, for example, and click outside. Then you will see that a straight line with a length of 2 meter has been entered or has been added to the spline geometry. If I add another value to have a straight length after the geometry point with 5 meter length, then you can see that after the geometry point, 5 meter straight length has been added to the geometry.
Similarly, you can control the duct geometry if you, for example, select the third line and enter a value for the vertical radius, for example, 100 meter, and click outside. You can see that a curve with a radius of 100 meter has been inserted into the duct geometry. You can also control the influence length of this radius. For example, if I set to 5 meter and click outside, then you will see that the length of this radius will only be considered on 5 meter altogether before and after the geometry point. In a similar fashion, when we look our structure from the plan view and we would like to enter a horizontal radius for a specific geometry point, you can also do it by entering a value for the horizontal radius entry. You can also control the horizontal or the vertical inclination at the geometry point. If I want to demonstrate it, I will select the forced entry line and I will add a vertical inclination of 0.05, for example. And this means that a, the tangent at the chosen geometry point will be changed. If I now enter, for example, minus 0.1, then the inclination will point in the other direction. However, we do not need this for this particular example file. And also, the default settings with the defined geometry points are normally acceptable and proper. If you want a detailed control or another type of control of the geometry, I'm suggesting you to enter many lines, and this means you will enter many geometry points, and simply with their U and V value, you can control the geometry, the real geometry of the duct the best. So what I'm saying is instead of having five geometry points, for example, along your duct, you can create 20 or 25 geometry points along the duct, and then you can be sure that the U and the V values are according to your taste. Now I will simply set back everything to the default values and uh, will accept the changes. But before we go on, we need to discuss the edit tendons tab. So as now we are finished with uh, editing the geometry of the duct, now we need to set up and edit the properties of the tendons below this tab. In the middle of this dialog box you can find the tendons chapter. By default one tendon is added and selected. As I deselected it, we can see that here at the tendon definition you can also work according to span station values or station values in meters. The default setting is that we would like to create one tendon from station span station 1 to span station 3, which is the end of our structure. But it should not be necessarily the case. For example, if I type here 2.1 and then click outside, you can see that it could be a case, for example, when we have a construction stage and we are concreting in different stages, then it could be a case when we insert a tendon in the duct, which is starting at the beginning of my structure and ends a little bit after the middle support of the structure. Then if I right click on the first entry line, I have the possibility to insert another tendon in the duct geometry. And here, for the second tendon, I can set up that it will start at span station 2.1 and ends at 3.0. So the use case of this setup, for example, is to concreting the superstructure into parts. Of course, you need to adjust uh, the stressing and the grouting stages to accommodate these uh, settings. So for example, this could be a viable setting. In construction stage 11, the first part of the tendon will be stressed and right away grouted. Then in a later construction stage 21, the second part of the superstructure will be concreted and uh, pre-stressing in construction stage 21, for example, and grouted in 22. 
please also notice that this is the second time when we meet construction stages. If you remember, in the cross-section editor, it was possible to activate or deactivate certain parts of the cross-section according to the construction stages. And now this is the second time when we can control the staging of the pre-stressing. For the tendon definition, it is very important to enter and set up a construction stage when we would like to stress the tendon, when we would like to crowd the tendon, and when it is going to be removed from the structure. If you can read zero, then it means it's never going to be removed in this case. Or if you can see a very high number, for example, construction stage 999, and your latest construction stage is number 50, for example, then it also means that the tendon is never going to be removed. Since we have a quite simple and small bridge, of course, we do not need this type of staging. We are just going to set up, set up one tendon within our duct. Therefore, I'm going to select the second line and I will go here to the delete selected line item and I will click on it. Then the line has been deleted and now I can set back the end of the tendon to be equal with 3.0 station. And now you can see that the tendon will start at the beginning of my structure and end at the end of my structure. The stressing stage will be set to 21. The grouting stage will be set to 22. And the removing will be set to 0. Then we can also define the number of the tendons within one duct. Here we can also add a number different from 1, for example 3. The use case of this input could be when you have only vertical bending moment on your cross section and the already created tendon geometry describes the path or the course of all the three tendons. However, this is not the case in our example file, so I will set this number back to 1. And of course, you can uh, enter a different name than the default one in the name field. If you select the tendon line, then you have the possibility to set its properties. Here you just need to follow the direction from the top to the bottom. In the general chapter, you can edit the name of the tendon. You can define an identification number if you want to. And you must enter a load case to store the curvature load of the pre-stressing. If I make the window a little bit bigger and click on the load case number, you have the possibility to choose from the already created load cases. For example, we can choose load case 11 because we were thoughtful and created this load case specifically to store the curvature loading. However, if you forget to do so, then on the right side, you have the possibility to modify the load case or simply create a new load case to store the curvature loadings. In the geometry chapter, one can change the input type from span station to station. So the same is applicable as it was for the editing the geometry of the duct. In the construction sequence chapter, one can edit the stage, the construction stage of the stressing, the grouting and the removing as we discussed previously. In the pre-stressing chapter, you can select the method of the pre-stressing. First, I'm going to go through the according stresses method and show the possibilities. Then I will mention the other two type of methods. So when we choose the according stresses method, that the pre-stressing will be undertaken according to the stresses. This means that the pre-stressing stress will be calculated with the help of the FPK value and the FP 0.1K values. Now let me show you in a diagram what these values are. If you open up Eurocode 1992, then the corresponding chapter is 3.3.3 where the strength is described. And below in the diagram, we can see these values, the FPK and the FP 0.1K. 
basically fpk is the tensile limit stress of the material in our example file it is 1570 megapascal there is also a corresponding limiting strain for the material which we call epsilon uk to assess the yield stress of a pre-stressing material we need to use 0.1 percent of the epsilon uk since the pre-stressing material doesn't have an exact location of the yielding stress or an exact value corresponding for the yielding therefore it is widely agreed that a, that a stress value corresponding to the 0.1 percent of the epsilon uk will be used as a yielding stress so if we look at this diagram the 0.1 percent epsilon uk is somewhere here if we draw a parallel line then it's going to intersect our diagram and this is the stress value fp 0.1 k that we are going to use as the tensile strength of the pre-stressing material okay when we have the fpk and the fp 0.1 k values of the pre-stressing material we just need to multiply it with some kind of factors to get the pre-stressing force in the tendon and if we come back to our dialog box this is how it goes first the software will calculate the maximum force of the tendon using the k1 and the k2 vectors and multiplies it with the fpk and the fp 0.1 k values respectively and it's going to choose the minimum of these two products similarly the average value of the tendon force the pm0 will be calculated using the fpk and the fp 0.1 k value multiplied with 0.75 and 0.85 respectively and the minimum value of these two products will be considered as the average value of the tendon force so if you choose the according stresses method then this is the way how the pre-stressing force will be calculated in the tendon and it is the best way if you have a newly designed structure apart from the method we also need to define some properties in the pre-stressing chapter such as the pre-stressing direction for example it could be that we are pre-stressing from the right or from the left first from the right and then the left first from the left and then the right for this particular example file i'm going to use the from right method this means that the left side of the tendon is fixed and then i will perform the pre-stressing from the right you also need to define the jacking procedure since it could be possible to perform a tensioning plus slip or tensioning plus release plus slip or tensioning plus release plus restressing plus slip since we do have a very small bridge the tensioning and the slip is appropriate for us to choose however if you have a longer bridge than you might want to use the tensioning plus release plus restressing and plus the slip okay and the last thing that you should adjust is the number of tendons that i've already mentioned previously i can recommend the according to stresses method when you are designing a new structure however when you have an already built structure then you are not going to reach your goal with the k1 and k2 k3 and k4 values for these cases there are two other pre-stressing methods are available in our software namely the free pre-stressing and the manual definition if someone chooses the free pre-stressing method then the pre-stressing factors needs to be set up wisely these factors can be selected and set in the free pre-stressing chapter such as the maximum general pre-stress factor, maximum pre-stress factor of first stressing, then maximum remaining pre-stress factor at the end of the slip, and so on and so forth. If someone would like to use this type of uh, pre-stressing method, please refer to the tendon manual for more information. If you choose the 
last method, the manual definition, it will give you even more freedom to define the pre-stressing in the tendon. If you work with the manual definition, some very important input needs to be added. However, in this example file, we are not going to use it. So for more information, please refer to the tendon manual again. So I will set back our pre-stressing method to according to stresses. And I would like to show you the additional data, which is the last chapter in the tendon definition. By default, the additional data information is set to none. But if you drop down the list and choose, yes, I would like to add additional data, then some input options will appear on the screen, such as the very first one, the forced transition length, such as the very first one called forced transition length. Here you can enter the forced transition lengths in meters, for example, I will add two meters, and the kind of procedure needs to be selected as well. The default setting is linear on both sides, and I have created a small sketch to explain all this information. On this sketch, you can see the girder and the maximum pre-stressing force that we would like to achieve. And the force transition lengths can be seen on both ends of the beam. This is what we had just set up to be equal with 2 meters. And the kind of progress now is set to linear. However, this line could follow a parabolic line as well. Then it would follow the curve that I added to the diagram right now. There are also other information to define as additional data, such as the reference area of the tendon in case of a crack bit check and also the circumference or, or the perimeter of the tendon needs to be input in this case. For this particular example 5, we don't need the additional data, so I will set all back to none or to no. And basically we are finished with the definition of the tendon. What we entered is just the load case to store the curvature load in. We define in which construction stage the tendon will be stressed and grouted. And we let all the default factors to play their roles. So now we just need to accept all the input by clicking on the OK of this dialog box. And the tendon has been generated as we can see on the screen. Also, we can be sure that our tendon has been generated successfully. If we go to the left side of our screen on the pre-stressing tab, we will find the tendons, the axis of the tendon, and the generated tendon geometry with the name of the first tendon, axis underscore one underscore one. In the next chapter, I would like to show you how to copy or clone this tendon. In this chapter, I'm going to show you how to clone or copy a tendon. If we want to add more tendons to our system, then we can simply go ahead and click on the PT editor one more time and define the tag geometry and a tendon within it. However, it's also possible to clone or to copy a duct and a tendon. Let me show you this opportunity, but first I will make the visualization a little bit clearer and I will represent only the structure and the tendon in it. Then I will go back to the pre-stressing tab. And if I click with my right mouse button on the tendon geometry, you can see the two options here, the clone and the copy. First, I will show you the behavior of the clone option. If I click on the clone, then I have the possibility to set up an offset in the U and V direction. First, I will clone the original tendon with minus 0 0.8 meter in the U direction and in the V direction with 0, 0.0 meter and I will click OK. Now, if I push the shift button and my middle mouse wheel, then I will be able to zoom in and rotate the model and we can see really a clone of the original tendon has been created. 
also I can verify this successful cloning if I click on the tendon geometry and then here a clone tendon will appear. I will redo now the procedure and clone the same tendon to the right side as well. So I just need to right click on the tendon geometry, choose the clone command again and instead of minus uh, 0 0.8 meter I need to enter now plus 0 0.8 meter and 0, 0.0 meter in the V direction. If I now click on the OK, you can see that the other tendon on the right side has been cloned successfully. Also, we can verify this again. Now we can see two cloned tendons below the original tendon geometry. Now I would like to demonstrate how to copy a tendon and what is the difference between copying a tendon and cloning a tendon. I will right click on the tendon geometry again and this time I will choose copy command and I will set a very huge offset in the U direction like 5 meter and the zero value to be equal with 0, 0.0 meter and then click on the OK button. You can see that the original tendon has been copied over with 5 meter in the vertical direction. Now I will simply zoom to the extent to see the structure in a better way. And I will now simply double click on the original tendon to go back to the Edit Geometry tab. And now intentionally I'm going to choose the V value in the second span to have a greater value, for example 5 meter. And now the geometry will look like something this. If I click now the OK button, we can see what I was expecting is... Now if I click on the OK button, we can see what I was expecting on the screen. Namely, that the original tendon and the clone tendons have a changed geometry, whereas the copied tendon maintained the original geometry. So this could best illustrate the difference between a cloned tendon and a copied tendon. Now I will simply set back everything to the original status. So I will delete the copied tendon geometry, right click on it and I will choose erase. And I will also set back the original geometry of the duct, which was, I believe, set to 1.15 and then I will click OK. So basically this is the status that I wanted to achieve. I have a main uh, tendon and I wanted to clone them in the right and in the left direction. If we consider either the copy or the clone options, in both cases the tendons were assigned to the original axis and to the original structural line that was defined along the axis. If you have another main girder in your system, then the best way is if you set up a new axis and assign the tendon geometry to the newly created axis. This is what I'm going to illustrate now. If we go to the System tab, then we have the possibility to create secondary axis based upon the main axis. If I click with my right mouse button, then I can create a secondary axis with an offset. For example, the name will be axis.a and the offset in the y direction will be 5 meter. In the global z direction it's going to be 0 meter. Then you simply click OK and the secondary axis with axis.a name has been created. Now let's go back to the pre-stressing tab and right click on the original tendon and we can have an option now from version 2020 namely to choose the copy to a different axis. If I select this option the software will ask me to select an axis the tendon geometry should be projected to. So I will simply select the secondary axis I just created and I will click OK and the copied tendon 
has been created and most importantly assigned to axis.a. And this assignment to the secondary axis makes a big difference because now the effects from the pre-stressing will be used for the structural lines that could be created along this secondary axis. Now I will clean up the model and set back the status that I would like to carry on. I can do that if, you, if I simply click on the tendon geometry and erase it first. Then if I go back to the system dialog box and click on the secondary axis A and also choose the delete. Now the model looks like as I want to be look like. So now we can continue by exporting the model and reviewing the results of the pre-stressing in the next chapter. In this chapter I'm going to export the model and review the results of the pre-stressing. You can undertake the export with this button in the top left corner. If I click on it and accept the default settings, simply click on the OK button. And now here we can see that module tendon was also uh, triggered and every executed module makes a so-called PLB file in the project folder and you can open this PLB file or report file if you go to the top line again to the top icons of the SophiePlus toolbar and click on the view results and from the drop-down list you need to choose now the results of tendon generation for beam elements. And then the report browser will be open for us. Now you can orientate yourself. So as I mentioned, we are in the project folder and we are looking at a so-called PLB file. So the PLB files can be reviewed with the report browser. In the report browser, below the content, we can find two tabs. The first tab is called Results, and it shows the results of the performed module on an A4 page format. Whereas the other tab, which is called Graphic, shows the corresponding pictures that can be found in the report independent from the A4 representation. If we go back to the results tab, we can have a better overview if we choose the representation of the page width. And we can start having a look at the results at the geometry of the reference axis number one. This is the same chapter that I'm presenting on the left side now. Here we can see the first axis and its station values and the found beam elements along the axis. Also, the exact coordinates are presented at the beam ends and the beam beginnings with the corresponding finite element node numbers and also the corresponding cross-section numbers. If we scroll down the page, we can see that all the elements has been found on the axis 1 and then starts the representation of uh, axis number 2 these axes have been created for the cloned tendons. And actually the found beam sequence is always the same because they are cloned ones. This information seems to be obvious, but sometimes there are problems with the definition of the tendons. And this is a very good starting point to find the problem. For example, if the found beam sequence is not continuous, that uh, the software was not able to recognize the proper sequence of the beam elements one after another. This could sometimes happen when there is a cross member or a cross girder along the main beam or along the longitudinal beams. And it is a little bit difficult for the software to find the correct nodal sequence along the main girder or the longitudinal girders. The next relevant information that we can have a look at is the span station or the span wise definition. So we can have an overview again, the zero station, station one, two, three, also with the station values in meter. And we can see the top positions of the tendon geometry or actually the duct geometry. 
According to this information, for example, now we can see that the middle support where the top point of the duct is, is at 27.3 meter. Then we can also find the input U and V values along the stations and the corresponding span station values are presented as well. So we can also double check the V values that were entered graphically. Then at the geometry of the tendon axis, we can see a very same or very similar table. Here again, we can see the U and V values, but this time it is represented for every single finite beam element. Also, we can see the inclination, for example, in the vertical direction. So delta V over delta S, we can see that it starts with a quite steep value. The tangent is quite big and then it starts to drop. And then we can see it starts its minimum value and then it starts to change the sign and go steeper and steeper in the other direction. We can also find here the radius of the duct in this column, which could be necessary if you have, for example, a warning after an export of the tendon, which states that the minimum radius of the duct has been exceeded. Then you can have a look at this radius values and find the location where this minimum value is reached. Also, the software internally calculates the arc lengths of the duct geometry. Since from these arc lengths, with the help of the Wobble co coefficient, the software is capable to calculate the loss along the tendon. Of course, the arc length needs to be summarized. And this is what can be found at the end of this table. We can see the length of the axis. And we can see the arc length of the tendon, which, as you can see, is greater than the length of the axis. And you can also find the sum of the angles along the tendon. And here, the minimum radius of the duct geometry presented separately to provide the opportunity to compare with the allowable minimum value of the bend radius of the duct. And of course, the effort mentioned values are plotted for the main uh, tendon and then also for the cloned ones. You can see it from the numbers, first for the axis 5000, then for axis 5001 and 5002. Then the next thing that we normally review is information about the pre-stressing system. On the right side, we can read the most important information. We are looking at or reviewing tendon 1, uh, the name of it axis underscore 1 underscore 1. The pre-stressing system number equals 1. Internally, there is a tendon geometry number 5000 of this tendon. We have one tendon per group. We can see the nominal force P0 here and the corresponding stress. So if I divide the 2008 kilonewton with the 1716 millimeter square, I should get the corresponding stress equal with 1170 megapascal. We can review the number of wires. We can also have a look at the yield strengths and the tensile strengths of our pre-stressing material. We can double check the permissible radius of the duct the maximum eccentricity in the duct, the outer diameter of the duct, and the important coefficients such as the mu, so the friction coefficients, and the wobble coefficient beta. If we scroll down a bit, we will see the important construction stages, such as the placement of the pre-stressing system and the stressing, then the grouting construction stage, we can also overview the sequence of the pre-stressing. In this case, it is from the right. And we can also review the corresponding factors in general and at the dead end core and at the end of the slip. We can also find the factors in detail at the first station and at the end station. And we can also have an overview about these factors in the coming pictures. So in the, in the report, we can find also some pictures about the elevation view of the tendon, for example, 
and also about the stress developing along the tendon. Here you will see also these factors and now we can look together with the table that I showed you previously. You just need to go to the view menu and choose the split horizontal and on one side we are going to see the factors on the picture and on the other I'm going to present it with the page width and now we can compare the picture with the table representation. The columns plus fricked and minus fricked contain the pre-stress force factors caused by stressing and releasing, but they are normalized to 1.0. The force coming columns contain the force factors which are formed after the pre-stress section. Finally, at the end column, which is called active, is the active pre-stress factor after the end of the whole pre-stressing procedure. So we can see here, for example, 0 0.85 at station 10, which can be seen in the picture as well. And at the end station, 64.6 meter, the active factor is 0 0.893, which can be also find, found in the picture. This active factor contains encourage slip and is the active pre-stress factor for the static analysis calculation. The pre-stress factor multiplied by the nominal force gives the corresponding static pre-stressing force in the system. The last line that says steel elongation in millimeter or simply just elongation in millimeter contains for every column the corresponding steel elongation to the pre-stressing force variation. However, you need to be aware of that all steel elongation values are theoretical without compressive strains of the concrete considered and without influence of one another. Or in other words, without the influence of another tendon in the system. Now let me explain a little bit about this picture and go through the values together with you. So the nominal value in the tendon is 1170 megapascal and which is what we can find here with a factor of 1.0. You can also find this value at uh, the end station, 64.6 meter. Over stress and release we can find the factor being equal with 1.0. Then comes the slip. Due to the slip the value of this nominal force will drop down to 0 0.893 times the nominal value. You can also find this uh, slip step in the picture and you can see that as a result the remaining active factor is going to be 0 0.893 times the nominal stress. If there were no slip in the system then we could see a gradual reduction of the stressing force along the tendon due to the friction. And finally, at station 10, at the beginning, there would be a remaining stress in the tendon being equal with 0 0.85 times the nominal stress. However, due to the slip, the starting value will be a little bit smaller. Then again, due to the friction, this slip is going to disappear or I would say the loss of the slip is going to disappear and find the peak value of the diagram which is at 0 0.944. I highly suggest you reviewing all the information. I highly suggest to you reviewing all these information for the clone tendons as well which you can do by simply clicking on the clone tendons, sc scroll down and then you will find these factors for the clone tendons as well. Okay, now we can simply go back to the view and change the view and close the splitting. And the only remaining information I'd like to show to you is the stored pre-stressing in the database. Here we can have an overview table again 
which represents the tendon geometry, the from two stations, the number of tendons, and the diameter of the tendon. Also, we can have a masses of the pre-stressing steel, which gives us an information about the used lengths of the tendon and the overall weight of the steel. After having reviewed the report, but before concluding this chapter, I would like to go back to Sophie Plus and show to you an extra feature during the export of the tendons. So now we can close back the report browser and we are directed back to Sophie Plus, hopefully. And the other export option I would like to show to you is the following. It could seem that I'm performing a regular export when I'm clicking on this usual button. However, if I click on the OK button, I will simply uncheck the process immediately checkbox. And only now I will click on OK. It seems first that nothing happened, but in the background a lot of things has happened. If we now open the project folder on our hard drive, then we are going to find very important information about the export of the tendon in text format. I'm presenting now my project folder, so desktop PTC bridge, and here you can find and see the corresponding WG drawing and <clears throat> also the corresponding .sophistic file but we can also see few dot files. If you search for the ptc underscore bridge underscore bpt dot dot file and double click on it, then in the teddy, so the text editor, the content of this file will be open. Of course, this information is too new for us and we cannot really understand the CADIMP language yet. But what you can see is that in module tendon, a definition of the tendon can be seen and later on this input can be very easily changed. It is something that I wanted to show to you because I think it's a very practical way of a definition of a tendon and especially to create or to modify new tendons in the system. Okay, basically that concludes the information of this chapter, how to export the tendon system and how to review the results of it. Now we can simply close the Teddy without saving anything and go back to Sophie Plus. Now I would like you to perform a normal export so click on the export button again and check in the process immediately button and then click on the OK button. After the export, please click on the Ctrl S to save the model. In this chapter, I would like to give you a follow up information on the verification of the pre stressing. According to Eurocode 5.10.2.1, the maximum stressing force in the tendon can be calculated as follows. You need to take the minimum of the following two products. First, you need to multiply the K1 factor with the FBK value. According to the national annexes, the K1 and the K2 value could be different, but normally we take the 0.8 and 0.9 values respectively. If you do so, in our example file, for example, you will find that the maximum uh, pre-stressing force in the tendon will be 1170 megapascal multiplied with the area of the tendons, which give you the 2008 kilonewton. The euro code also instructs you to calculate the initial pre-stress for the PM null or the sigma PM null value as follows. The FPK value needs to be multiplied with the factor K7 and the FP 0.1K value needs to be multiplied with the K8 factor. 
Again, these values are codependent, or I should say national annex dependent. The default values for these factors are 0 0.75 and 0 0.85 respectively. If we calculate these initial stress in our tendon, in our example file, then we are going to find the minimum value being equal with 1104.5 megapascal. Okay, now let's assume that we would like to calculate the initial pre-stress in the tendon, but taking into consideration the loss coming from the friction along the length of the tendon. In this case, you need to use a multiplication with E on the power of nu times gamma, where mu is the friction coefficient, and gamma contains the angular displacement plus the wobble coefficient multiplied with the length of the tendon. If we undertake the calculation, we are going to get 994.3 megapascal as the remaining nominal stress in the tendon. If we compare this value to the original nominal stress in the tendon, we are going to get a factor of 0 0.85, which can also be found next to the diagram. So basically what we calculated is what is going to be the remaining nominal stress in the tendon after being considered the loss due to the friction along the tendon length. Okay, with this information I think we can conclude the chapter of the pre-stressing and we are going to continue now with the modeling.